Hello and welcome guys. Another week, another episodic review of House of the Dragon. This time we are on episode 5, which is called We Light the Way. And just to put it out there straight away, what a cracking episode this is. Probably up there with the best, if not top two at least, of the episodes we've seen so far. And I know we've only seen five, don't do me on my maths, but it is absolute masterful storytelling. The characters in this are phenomenal, the acting's brilliant. The set pieces are amazing. The drama is top notch. So before we get into the details and the episodic breakdown, guys, it goes without saying, but this episode is going to contain spoilers. I will also leave links to the other episodic reviews below, which we've already done. And let me know your thoughts on this episode in the comments. So we start off a wonderful opening. Mr. Damon Targaryen is walking towards the veil. And you can see it's the veil because the cinematography on it is absolutely amazing. Vast towers, vast landscapes, and I just recall seeing parts of the Veil from Game of Thrones, and it looks absolutely on point. He's returning back to uh, the Veil, got his uh, cloak up. We then also get a shot of Damon's actual wife, so not the wife that he had as a slave that he freed, but didn't actually free, and not his niece type of wife that he wants, but his actual by marriage wife, <laughs> the one that's in the Veil which he obviously married just for, you know, power and political position. And she is talking to some guy on the horse. I think it's her uncle. It might not be. I've just made that up. And then she uh, rides off. We get a nice panning shot of all the landscapes. And then we see the wife approaching the entry road to the Vale. As she's going along, we see Damon walking towards her like Darth Maul, hood up, face down, can't see much about him. And he's just got that demeanor that you know something's about to go down. As he gets closer to her, they have a little bit of a to-do, a bit of a domestic out on the open road. She gives him some grief about not actually being there and saying that, I heard that, you know, you're looking to move on to your niece and about a child being struck down if she ever gets pregnant and things like that. Damon flinches, causes the horse to sort of rear up and fall over. As it falls over, it completely crushes his wife. She is at this point paralyzed on the floor. She's still breathing, sort of, um, but she can't move. Her bones are completely fractured and she's gasping for air. She can't even move her neck. She's absolutely out cold at this point. This is the bit where Damon's character really comes into his own. So as he's walking away, he gives her a, a little one-liner on, you know, a Targaryen always comes out on top, that sort of thing. And then she mocks him about not being able to finish sexually. So he... Takes this to heart, as you know, if you've seen the prior episodes and you've been paying attention, Damon has issues performing, basically. He put, he struggles to get it up, he struggles to keep it up, and at this day and age, in this time, there's obviously not any Viagra that they can buy from any merchants, so he's struck by this as he's walking away, he overhears what she said, he turns round, just as he turns around, he bends down to pick up like a massive rock, and then straight away you're thinking... Here we go. Here we absolutely go. And he walks towards her. He lifts the rock up. Just as he's about to slam her, the rock down on her face, we get one of those old school Game of Thrones cut scenes where it cuts to either a meal, someone eating something. If you guys can remember sort of the later Game of Thrones episodes where Jorah Mormont sort of contracted Grayscale and then he goes to Samwell, who is at this point training to be a maester and then he's carving off the skin off of his back and then it cuts to a scene where there's a guy eating what looks like a chicken pie, but it looks very similar to what's happened in, in the prior scene. We get this here, so just as he's about to hit the, the wife on the head, we get a cut where someone chops the head of a fish and just batters the head of a fish off. So we obviously know that she is done for, but in true classic Game of Thrones fashion and the way that it was put together in terms of camera shots and angles was absolutely perfect. I started laughing. Shouldn't laugh when someone's head's just got caved in with a stone, but I just thought the way it was put together was brilliant. We then see Otto getting ready to leave. Obviously, in the last episode, um, Viserys removed the hand of the King Pin and said to him, you're dumb, can't be trusted, I don't trust you, how dare you accuse my daughter of incest, basically. And he's he's out of there, he's done. Just as he's leaving, he bumps into Alison, and Alison sort of says, I absolutely believe what Rhaenyra's saying. Why are you leaving? You know, why did you accuse her? And then he kind of says... Do you really think that she's going to admit it? Do you think that she's going to hold her hands up and say, yes, I did have this off of my uncle? 
no, she's not. And then he kind of puts a little seed in Alison's head where he says, when uh, Aegon gets of age, which is obviously her son, the king's son as well, Viserys, and technically it's Rhaenyra's brother, but it'll be half-brother. She, He sort of says to her, as he comes of age, if the king dies, when the king dies, Rhaenyra's going to claim the throne. Do you think she's going to step down and allow Aegon to, to take that throne? No, she's not. But as it is with true Targaryen history, he should be the one that takes up the throne and steps up. So they have a little bit of an argument. Alison says it's not about that, but you can see just through the great acting that she is absolutely on board with what he's saying. She doesn't want to admit it, and she knows that Rhaenyra is kind of going a little bit rogue. She's kind of going a little bit pro Rhaenyra, and she's not considering the Targaryen dynasty at all, really, aside from she wants it to be different. She wants it to open up to women, and she wants to become that one person, that first woman that sat on the throne um, in the Targaryen current-day dynasty, where she can say that she is queen. So the conversation ends with Otto basically saying to Alison, his daughter, Renaira is going to go for the throne. As soon as the king dies, it's going to be like a flock of seagulls to that chair. And you need to be wary of it because her claim is going to be legit in her head. It will cause a, a war. It will cause a rebellion amongst the people because they don't want a woman to be sat on the throne. It goes against tradition, all that kind of stuff. And he kind of ends the conversation with Renaira's claim will be sealed by her children, i.e. Alicent's children, being slain, so there is no dispute over who gets it next. And he just kind of leaves it at that. So it's a bit of a mic drop, but Alison is, although she's verbally disagreeing with him, you can see the conflict on her face. You can see that he's got a point, and she kind of takes it away from the scene. We then go into the next scene, which is Renaira and Viserys, where they're traveling to High Tide in Driftmark, and essentially to meet the House Valerian. If you guys remember, there was a... A bit of a to-do in the prior episodes where Viserys was trying to get Rhaenyra to marry one of the sons of the House Valerian just to bring together the houses, to bring together unity and to not dispute Rhaenyra's claim basically. Viserys said to her before, the only way you're really going to seal your destiny and be able to sit on the throne even though I've promised it, once I'm not here, there's no one here to sort of back my claim. So the only way you can really do that is if you marry into a powerful house, we bring the two houses together you have children and then that will cement your claim to go for the throne and then when your children are of age you can pass it down to them so obviously in between the scenes we don't actually see Renaira agreeing to this correct me if I'm wrong in the comments guys but we don't see this in any of the episodes but in this episode we see them travel into Driftwood on the assumption that she's going to agree to marry one of the sons and seal her claim to the throne as this is happening we get a sort of back and forth between these two travel into Driftmark and we see Alicent sat with one of the lords and I'm going to call him Long John Silver because I don't actually know what his name is, but he's got a peg leg. So he's going to be called Long John and he's basically trying to put a doubt into Alicent's head in terms of her relationship with Rhaenyra and saying that essentially you can't trust everything Rhaenyra says. She's got a claim. She's a Targaryen. She's going to do absolutely everything in her power to make sure that that claim goes through. You shouldn't always trust what she says. Not saying she's evil and she's out to get you and all that kind of stuff. But he talks about her illness. And in the prior episode, we obviously found out that she slept with uh, Sir Criston. And there was an assumption that it was Damon, but they didn't actually sleep together. And it was Criston that she slept with in the end. And it was apparent that she was potentially pregnant. In this episode, the Lord talks about the illness, i.e. the pregnancy and says that Renaira didn't drink the tea, and he's confident that she didn't drink it because she's suffering from symptoms of pregnancy, i.e. feeling sick, feeling nauseous, all that kind of stuff. And uh, Alicent's kind of sat there. Then also, bearing in mind she's heard what she's heard from her dad, she's also getting this from this guy, Lord Long John, and um, he's talking about how she didn't take the tea because he's seen a lot of the things that are associated with pregnancy in Renaira behind the scenes. So Alison, again, is sat left feeling doubtful about Rhaenyra, feeling doubtful about who's telling the truth, about who's got the biggest agenda. And you can see the conflict on her face. And the acting from the character that plays Alison in these scenes is absolutely amazing. It's on par with the scenes of the prior episodes where we had Viserys, where he was sort of in conflict between being a dad, basically, and being a king. And 
trying to please everybody. And you could just see it. Even if they weren't speaking, you could see the absolute conflict on their face and their body language. And in this scene, it's no different. Really, really good. And I really enjoyed it. In the next part, we get Lord Corlius, I think his name is, or Corlius, the, the Driftwood guy, Valerian guy, um, meets Viserys and introduces, obviously, the wife, which is the cousin of Viserys, i.e. Driftwood's wife. It gets confusing. But they're discussing uh, the death of Damon's wife. They've heard the news now. They've they Basically, it's been declared as an accident, although some people are convinced it wasn't, and they're right. But they're saying, you know, what happens if... You know, they, you die, Viserys, and your brother's going to lay claim to the throne. Rhaenyra's going to lay claim to the throne. But there's also a son involved with Aegon, i.e. yourself and your wife. So who basically dominates the, the claim? Viserys then says, look, if we put our houses together, we propose this marriage between one of your sons and my daughter. It will seal the fate of both our houses. It means Rhaenyra will still get the claim to the throne. It will also secure their children so that your house will get a place in royalty in legendary history, basically, at some point. Corlius asks how the succession itself is going to be handled, and Viserys says that the children will take the throne after Rhaenyra. Corlius isn't happy with this. I'm saying Corlius. I don't know if I've pronounced his name properly, but I'm going to say Corlius. Asks for the children to carry the Valerian name, and Viserys agrees. However, there's a caveat to it. So Viserys agrees, but then he says... They will take the Targaryen name when they ascend the throne. So essentially, you can keep the name. The children could keep the Valerian name with Rhaenyra as queen. However, when Rhaenyra dies or abdicates the throne and one of the children take it, then they will have to take the name Targaryen. So Viserys is really putting his foot down here. He, I thought he was going to be a little bit more accommodating to what they wanted, just to secure the marriage. But it's nice to see that he's actually still got that Targaryen fire and blood in him that he's actually not backing down he's basically saying if you want to get in on this if you want to get in on this source you need to meet me in the middle it's enough that I'm saying your children can keep their names because that's against my tradition the tradition of my house the tradition of my family but when one of them becomes king or queen they have to take the Targaryen name because that's where the bloodline is and it's left at that we then get a scene where Rhaenyra is walking along the beach with future husband, i.e. one of the sons of the Valerian house. They're discussing wedding arrangements, and I thought, this is a pretty weird and pointless scene. However, Rhaenyra then talks about how she prefers duck over geese meat, and the guy's like, what do you mean? And then she goes into detail about sometimes you just have to do your duty, but that doesn't stop you, or doesn't shouldn't stop you from being who you are. So it's hinted at here that Rhaenyra has clocked that the son is gay he's not interested in her at all and she understands this but also she knows that she's not attracted to him either gay or not and she's actually got feelings for Kristen so what she proposes in this scene is and it ties in nicely to what they were saying in the prior scene about um, bringing in duck meat over geese meat and she says let's just do what our fathers have asked us to do that doesn't stop us from being who we want to be i.e let's just do our duty get married seal the houses, seal the name, and then I can go off and still be with Kristen, do what I want to do with him, and you can still be off with your, your lover as well, and we'll keep it a secret, basically. He likes the sound of that, he's loving it, so they agree, and they kind of share a, a quite a familiar ground moment where they don't feel feelings for each other, but they, they're on the same wavelength, and it just feels like it's going to work. So then we get a scene with Kristen, and he's talking to Rhaenyra about his ambitions. He says he wants to go back to Braavos. He wants to explore the land. There's so many things that he hasn't seen. He says that he's tainted his image as a knight. Even though people don't know about it, he holds on to that guilt. And he knows he's broken a vow by sleeping with her. So Rhaenyra then says, don't worry about it. When I'm queen, we can do what the hell we want. And he that's not kind of good enough for him. He still feels like he's been disloyal. He feels like he's let himself down more than anything and he's let his family down and his name down. So he wants to reclaim that by giving up his duty as a knight. He wants to give up his white cape. He wants to give up his king's guard right. And he wants to go back to essentially being a normal citizen. He wants to go back to farming. He wants to go back to being able to explore the lands, have his own piece of uh, land and children and things like that. And just focus on the basic things in life that makes people happy. Rhaenyra has other plans. 
she says that her path is taking her down a different route. She has a duty and she can't accommodate what he wants. He asks her to go with him, basically. He says, just give up the throne, give up the family, give up your duty, fuck all that and come with me. We can start a new life in Bravos. We can start a family. We can be together, all that kind of stuff. And she royally shoots him down. She just says, no, that's not what I want. And again, the Targaryen blood is coming through in this scene where she says, it's not what I want. That's what you want. That's what you want me to be. But that is not how I picture myself to be in the future. I want more, basically. So he understandably feels betrayed. He feels let down. He was hoping for kind of like a marriage and a commitment to each other where they can go away and live happily ever after. But it's not happening. And he walks away pretty pissed. We then get a scene where we see Viserys and he is literally stumbling all over the shop at this point. He is on his last legs, guys. He is dying. Obviously, the cut that he took from the throne, which is believed to be an old curse. Whenever anyone in the Game of Thrones lore history, whenever they sit on the throne and they get cut by one of the blades, they always die. So this is kind of like a foreshadowing of the things to come. We see him stumbling about. He looks half dead. He's coughing up blood. And Alicent summons in Kristen. Now, one of the sort of advisors goes to Kristen and says, you've been summoned. And Kristen's like, I've just seen the king. Why is he calling me back in? And it's like, it's not the king that's summoning you. It's Alicent. And then you think, oh, shit, she's found out. She, somehow she's found out. You just know. So the next scene is that Kristen goes to Alicent. She starts off asking him, you know, how you are and all that kind of thing. And it's such a good way in this scene where they deliver attention. You don't get any high-strung violins. You don't get any sort of musical atmosphere. You just get a good dialogue conversation be between two strong characters who I feel are going through a really good character arc versus the first couple of episodes. I didn't really care that much for Alison. I didn't really care much for Kristen in the beginning. But the way that they've built these characters up is absolutely amazing. But anyway, she, Alison basically says that she's concerned about Rhaenyra. She says, uh, come and sit down with me. Let's talk about Rhaenyra. And straight away, you know, she's going to ask him about if he witnessed what happened with her and Damon. Now, she talks about her father receiving an account of, lapse, you know, a lapse in morals, goes on about it. And Kristen, the poor guy, I think everyone's been here in this position at some point in their life or at least knows somebody that's done this. The way that it's presented in this scene is absolutely amazing. So she starts talking about all the accounts that she's heard about this, about that. She doesn't exactly say what she's going to ask him. She just sort of hints at it and hopes that he's going to step in and say, yeah, I saw it, I witnessed it, or no, don't know what you're talking about, or yes, I was with Renaira. Not like that, but I was with her that night. I was protecting her. Nothing happened. She didn't leave her chamber, all that kind of stuff. Alison's hoping to hear some of that. Kristen, the poor soul, <laughs> thinks that Alison knows about him and Renaira. So he just comes out and says, I, yeah, I admit it. I did it. I did myself a disservice. I've done this. I've done that. And she's like, what are you talking about? And he's like, me and Renaira, you know, we spent, I've tarnished my cloak. I'm really sorry. I feel guilty about it. I've tried to own up about it. I've spoke to her about it. She says, I, I've got nothing to worry about. So Alison instantly, this is just one of those scenes where you think, oh shit, he's unintentionally thrown Renaira right under the bus because he thinks Alison has found out about him and her. But actually, what she was going to ask is about her and Damon. So this, again, cements Alicent's worry where she's heard from Long John and Otto and some of the accounts that she's had from some of the people around the city or maids and stuff. She's also getting it from one of the most trusted knights. And Alicent was the one that helped put Sir Kristen into power in terms of becoming a Kingsguard. He was picked from the tourney alongside Rhaenyra when they were together. They decided on who to pick. So she absolutely uh, trusts Kristen. So when he says, yes, I slept with her, I did this, I did that. I've tarnished my, my cloak. I hang up my right as a knight. You can behead me if you want to. I'm ashamed. Alison is absolutely speechless. And I'm like, oh, no, he's just dropped her straight in it. But honestly, the way that this scene's delivered is absolutely brilliant. It's probably one of the strongest scenes so far in this series in terms of just, just sheer drama the way the dialogue's presented, the way the characters act, the way they react to each other's dialogue is absolutely perfect storytelling. So I really felt for the guy because I thought, you dick, you've just put your foot straight in it. You're saying, hang me, chop my head off if you want all this. Alison had absolutely no idea that this was going on. 
she was about to talk about Damon and Rhaenyra, but not only has he thrown himself in it, he's thrown Rhaenyra into it as well, which now is the third strike. This is the third time Alicent's heard something that's contradictive to what Rhaenyra said, and it's clear at this point she's had enough. She's sort of, you could see it on her face. She sat there thinking, all these people can't be liars. Rhaenyra's telling me one thing. All these people are saying the complete opposite of what she said, and they're all kind of united as well, but not actually friends or spend any time together so there has to be some substance to what they're saying you can absolutely see the disappointment the shame the conflict and the betrayal on her face is absolutely brilliant so we think Kristen's going to get his head lopped off Alison sort of swallows her pride and looks at him and just says just go it's fine don't worry and he's he sort of like oh, what do you mean and she's like just go just go so I think at this point she's still trying to process the fact that her best friend is continuously lying to her i know she's you know she's the queen and stuff like that but she she's had so many heart to hearts with renaira from the beginning of the series they didn't get on when alison sort of stepped in as queen but arguably that was down to her dad otto i.e hand of the king who kind of pushed her into it and pulled a little bit of a uh, bit of strings in there as well so she understandably feels quite upset and let's she just lets him go we then get a scene where Viserys is laying in bed ill. He is on death's door at this point. He looks gaunt. He looks drained. He looks old, withered. He's got no energy. He's laying in bed, literally sweating his tits off. And there's maesters around him trying to sort of decide what the best course of action is. They suggest uh, medicines, leeches, anything. And they don't really know what's wrong with him. He's just deteriorating at quite a rapid rate, but no one's willing to admit it. The... There's then a Tushin scene where Viserys asks Lionel, the advisor, what people will think of him as a king, etc. And he just says, you know, I want my legacy to be like my forefathers, but even greater. And this scene really is quite sad because you know what's coming. This is a scene really that's going to lay the path to Viserys' death. I am not sure if he's going to die. I'll touch on what happens at the end in a second. I'm not sure if he's dead by the end of this episode. I think he might go on a little bit longer. But equally, they might just palm him off halfway through the series. Um, either way, my prediction was that by the end of this season, Viserys was definitely going to be dead, and I thought Rhaenyra was going to die as well. But what they might do, I'm not sure how many episodes we've got, whether it's 8, 10, or 12. Um, I think what they might do is kill Viserys off now. So by episode 6, he's gone. Episode 6 is going to be the funeral, the start of the rebellion. And then by the end of the season, potentially, if not, it'll be by the end of season two, without a shadow of a doubt, Rhaenyra is going to be gone. Um, and then that's going to clear the path for Daemon, Aegon, and the massive rebellion that comes behind it with the Black, uh, the Black Friars and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be really interesting to see how it unfolds. It is so far staying true to the lore. It's staying true to the context of the books. But there's loads of elements that are being fleshed out for our entertainment and i'm absolutely loving it we then get a nice lovely dragon scene and we also see jason lannister again this guy i think is going to be one to watch because he's appeared a couple of times now but he's not had really much substantial input into what's going on but come on he's a lannister he's going to be in there somehow he's going to be in underneath causing havoc so i wouldn't be surprised that if the rebellion when the rebellion kicks off he's going to have a hand in it and he's going to have a hand in on what sort of instigates it whilst his house is slowly going to be creating more and more influence and gain more and more power hopefully we'll get to see some more amazing Lannister names but even if we don't I think they did it to death in Game of Thrones it was mostly about the Lannisters obviously there was loads of other houses involved as well but it was centering it always around Cersei Tywin Tyrion was in there Jaime's relationship as well so we had quite a bit of the Lannister so this is all about the Targaryens here so we might not get any more than uh Jason Lannister but even if we do I think it will be welcome literally we're at the wedding sort of coronation ceremony just the celebration of the fact that they get married and Jason is sort of just addressing his well wishes to Rhaenyra passes on his thanks and I think yeah this this is you know this is a Lannister when does a Lannister ever pass on well wishes? Unless it's Tyrion. He's probably the only one, aside from Jamie, when he kind of went through a good guy story arc. Doesn't happen. So I also don't trust him. He's just got an agenda about him. He's got a way about how he talks to people. He's got a way about 
just how he presents himself in the scenes. And I think there's more to this character than meets the eye. And I think he's going to take a very dramatic twist soon. And he's going to have a lot more involvement than we think. This scene is well, this whole sort of next 10 minutes is leading towards the end of the episode now. But we're at the wedding ceremony. We're in the keep. All the houses are turned up. So you've got the Lannister, J uh, Jason Lannister. You've got the Valerian house, whose son is obviously now committed to marrying Rhaenyra. We then get Damon who rocks up and everybody's in this room. And to me, this absolutely stunk of the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones. That scene where you've got every, all the, the big faces in one room. There's an atmosphere. People are sort of side glancing, looking at each other, just waiting for a dagger to come out. You've got like this nice slow paced violin music and you think any minute now someone's going to get it. It just had that feel to it. It, it sensed and I think... What makes this show so good is that they're constantly referring back to events in Game of Thrones without shoving it in your face. So instantly they knew if they played the music a certain way, it wasn't exactly the same song or the same tunes, but they did it and played it in such a way that it instantly clicked in my head. This is the Red Wedding. Oh my, you know, someone's going to die. Someone's going to get it. They're doing it all over again. But... It goes on and on and on. And it sort of plays with your emotions a little bit. It plays with what you know. And it plays with the fact that everyone's watched Game of Thrones. Everyone knows what the Red Wedding is. How it happened. What happened. We remember what we felt when we saw it. We remember that sense of dread. When Catelyn Stark sees the dagger underneath the sleeve of Bruce Bolton. And you think, shit, they're all going to die. Then you get the crossbows hitting Rob. You get the poor girlfriend getting stabbed to death while she's pregnant. Catelyn gets it. And it's like, come on. Like, it just it just had that vibe without anyone actually saying anything. Instantly, we were put into the scenario of the Red Wedding. And I thought, oh, shit, it's about to get heavy. We then get various scenes within uh, the scene itself. Where Viserys is sort of preparing to make a speech about the houses. And then as he's talking about the great houses coming together and everything's great. The door bursts open and Alicent walks in and you think, oh shit. And then someone makes a funny remark about she's just interrupted the king. He's not going to be happy with that. And she just doesn't care. She's got that face where she's kind of given up. Her friends betrayed her countless amount of times. She doesn't really enjoy her marriage to the king. He just uses her as a sex toy almost. Just uses her to basically push out airs, which is what um, her and Renaira were talking about before. And she's just come to the realization that being the queen that she wanted to be is nothing like it is in reality. And she's had enough. She just wants to sack it off. And I think she's got that air about her now where it's dangerous because she doesn't give a shit. And she's fed up is the main thing. She's absolutely fed up with the way things have gone. And she's trusted people. She's been good. She's been nice. And I can see her character taking a real big twist. If if Viserys is dropped dead in this episode and she takes over as queen... It's going to get mental. I think she's going to go, not full-blown Cersei, but I think she's going to go down the route of being an absolute nutcase. I think she's going to be ruthless. I think she's just going to come in and take absolutely no shit. So it's going to be interesting to see how the next episode pans out and how she carries that forward. But it's been building up, building up over countless episodes where her sort of patience for people and the trust has been broken countless amount of times, Renaira especially. She's just absolutely fed up of it. And she's just hearing lies upon lies upon lies. And you could just see on her face, she's thinking, why am I constantly listening? They, these people are supposed to be my friends. I've done right. I've done you know, justice by everybody. I've tried to be a good queen. I've tried to be open, honest. I don't want anyone to get in trouble. And it's got her absolutely nowhere. She's been left in the dark, fed shit, a bit like a mushroom. And <laughs> she's just, she's had enough. And you can see that on her face. And it's acted beautifully. She walks in, um, you can see Viserys is kind of looking as if to say, what the fuck are you doing on midway speech? So that's already caused a little bit of tension. Alicent sort of sits down and then we get the courtship dance where everyone's kind of doing the, you know, the Jolly Roger in circles in the, in the ballroom. All the guests are there, they're all dancing together. And then Alicent gets up and goes to speak to her uncle, who has turned up in place of Otto, basically, who, if you remember, has now been banished he his claim of hand of the king is gone Viserys has booted him out and said do one all because Rhaenyra put the knife in and made a little bit of a lie about 
also trying to be the man, which is kind of true. But in the that example that she used about him, that wasn't what he was doing. He was actually trying to defend the king's honor and uh, it backfired. So he's gone, but the uncle's there. And Alison has a quick chat with him about the family, about what happened to Otto, her father. And the uncle just kind of says, it's OK, I'm here. I'm going to make sure that our family presence remains where it should be. And it's kind of like, oh, shit, what does he mean by that? We then get Gerald Royce of Runestone, who confronts Damon and comes up to him and basically says, you're shitting on your family name. You're a disgrace. I know you've killed my sister. So this is where obviously there's a going to be a big group of people out there that know what Damon's like. And this is one of the guys. So it's the sister um, who's been killed. So he is obviously the brother of Damon's actual wife, who he's just literally murdered and left her to die on the road. He's convinced Damon's done it. He says, I'm going to prove to everybody what you are, what you like. Um, Damon, as cool as a cucumber, just says, that's a strong accusation. What do you think is going to happen now that your sister's dead? We've got no children. Oh, hang on a minute. Aren't I the one that's going to inherit Runestone? So does that mean that I'm going to be your kings at some point? Gives it all that sort of speech. And then he just says, I'll see you at the Vale for the petition. And then just leaves it at that. Damon's character is honestly probably my top three characters he was he was my absolute favorite but i'm loving viserys's acting it's a shame that he's gone if he has gone but i don't think guys as the character arcs go on there's there is a bad character in this i don't think there is otto's interesting damon's interesting renaira viserys even alison now i'm warming to i'm warming to her story and her struggle as well you can really start to see this come to life on the screen now but anyway go back to what i was saying so Damon kind of just dismisses him off and just says, do one. I'm going to be in charge of you soon to kiss my ass. The bloke backs down and just realizes what he said. And he's like, Ugh, just sort of sidesteps away, tail between his legs. Um, we then move on to the Valerian sister. So obviously there's the two Valerian brothers and a sister. Damon starts saying how pretty she is. And you can sense that he doesn't actually think that. He's just talking a good game, trying to pull out the, the goods and potentially get her on side for something that he wants to plan in the future. He might want to marry her. Who knows? He seems to be going through a bit of a Black Widow type approach at the minute with these women. Marrying people to gain power and to gain sort of unity, basically, which is what Game of Thrones is about, right? So Damon's doing that. He's moving on her. And then we see the Valerian son who's due to marry Rhaenyra. He's obviously in a gay relationship with someone that's uh, known to the family. They These two are discussing how... They overheard, there's there's a rumour that Rhaenyra slept with one of her Kingsguard and it's Kristen. So they're having a discussion about this as all this is playing out and there's a little dance going on in the middle of the room. It then gets a little tense and the um, the gay partner, so not the Valerian son, the, the partner of the Valerian son, the one that he's having sort of sexual escapades with in the background that nobody knows about, he goes over to Kristen and sort of says, look... I know what I know. We're all here to do what we're here to do. Essentially, what he says is, I will keep your secret secret if you keep my secret secret, which is I'm giving him a good time. So unless you want your secret to come out, you're going to turn a blind eye to what's going on over here. Essentially, blackmailing him, saying, if you don't keep your mouth shut and you don't let us do what we need to do behind the scenes, Renaira's already agreed to it. So we're going to do this. We're going to do that. At this point, I thought initially what makes Kristen crack is the fact that he's being blackmailed and he's been pushed to his limit emotionally anyway. But I think what's actually happened here is that he also feels betrayed by Renaira in the sense that he feels that she led him up a path, that they were going to get married, they were going to move away. Or even if the, you know they weren't going to move away, that he was going to become king or at least be at her side and be able to live openly and honestly about their relationship together which didn't happen so he's already at an all-time low but then you've got this guy coming over saying we've already spoke to Renaira so again Kristen's the last to know about Renaira's plans he's the last to know about what she wants even though she slept with him and she made him feel like he was a big part of her life and that he was a big part of the decisions that she made to go against not only her own commitments and her own promises as future queen 
but also his promises as a Kingsguard. So at this point, he feels like an absolute tool, like he's been used and he just absolutely snaps. But as just before he does this, we get one more scene, which is what we see here. Uh, Damon moves into Rhaenyra, sort of says, oh, you know, missed you and all that kind of shit. It gets a bit weird. They get a little bit too close. Um, Rhaenyra then says, look, if you want to be with me, you're going to have to do something a bit more substantial than last time. And they kind of reignite that weird spark that they had when they went on a little rampage around the city uh, at nighttime in the last episode. So Damon's sort of saying, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And she's like, what you need to do is get your sword out. You need to carve through my father's king's guard, slay my father, stay, take the throne, do this, do that. And she's kind of egging him on. Um, I thought it was like a sarcastic sort of prod, but she's actually egging him on to do it. And I think Damon being Damon, he anchors for that power. He anchors for that just that meaning of purpose. He wants to be that guy that people go, this is the king. You know, he's a badass. Don't fuck with him. He'll chop your hand off if you steal shit. Like, he wants to be that guy that he is in the history books as the man, basically. Not just the man by his name. He wants to be the man by his image and his character. And we've seen that in prior episodes where he's essentially doing absolutely everything he can to be known as the guy. So Rhaenyra says, that's what you need to do. Just do this, do that. And he kind of like, sort of looks at her. They get a bit close. It gets a bit weird. And then all of a sudden, there's a little bit of a commotion in the crowd. You hear someone screaming. There's eyes sort of going back and forth between each other. There's a couple of, yeah, do that. A couple of nods. And there's obviously an orchestrated attack that goes on in the crowd that causes a bit of a commotion. We can't actually see what's going on. Viserra stands up and says, what in the Seven Kingdoms is going on? And sort of, Rhaenyra gets pushed away. She lands down on the side. Damon protects her a little bit. But then there's a commotion between uh, Kristen jumps in in the fray. And everyone's involved. The Valerian house is there. The Valerian daughter is in there. And obviously the Valerian son then jumps in. And there's just a little bit of a commotion. You can't really see what's going on. You can't see if anyone's hurt. You can't see, is someone, you know, stabbed? Has, has someone been beaten up or something? I don't know. Whilst all that's going on, we kind of see what's happening so as the camera sort of pans over the top of the crowd you get a little bit of a parting of the sea you see that Rhaenyra's safe she's been pushed into sort of a table but she's on the floor she's all right Damon's kind of lurking looking around and the camera pans to each of the characters and I sat there and I thought they haven't shown Kristen yet he's he's absolutely gone mental on that guy that's just said keep this quiet I'll have your number you know don't come at me with what I can and can't do with the Valerian son We've got it covered. We've already spoke to your girl, all that kind of stuff. And he's just absolutely gone bonkers. He's snapped. So we see um, Kristen battering the living shit out of Laurel's lover. So Laurel is the Valerian son. He absolutely decimates him, smashes his face in to the point that his face caves in and he dies. Everyone's kind of confused as they say, why has he just done that? What's going on? Viserys doesn't know what's happened either and then you just get an almighty scream from Laurel because obviously he had that relationship with him and he's absolutely good that <laughs> he's just been murdered basically in front of everybody. We then move forward. The closing scenes are very very powerful. If it couldn't get any more powerful than that it ends with vows being said. So we've got Rhaenyra and uh, Kristen in two separate places. So Rhaenyra's talking to Laurel and um, they're doing their vows. Laurel's kind of like emotionless, blank-faced, listening to the maester. Rhaenyra's kind of the same, but she's a little bit chirpier because she's going to be queen and this is the way to cement it and all her dreams and her plans are coming true. All the while, Alicent's sort of sat in the background, cross-armed, giving it the, yeah, you fucking, you watch. Let's see how far you get kind of thing. They're stood in front of the weir tree um, and then you get Kristen who is seen taking off his cape he throws his helmet down, he puts his sword in the ground, and he pulls out a dagger. And the camera shot is at the end of the dagger, so it looks like he's about to stab himself. Just as he's about to do it, he's stopped by Alison, and she says, stop. We don't then see what happens after that, but I get the assumption, and we're led to believe that she either makes a bit of a deal with him, or um, she's going to use him in some way to overthrow Rhaenyra's claim. I would imagine what's going to happen is... She's going to say, look, I will sort Rhaenyra out. She's lied to me. She's lied to you because she's got that influence that Otto's given her as as his um, as her dad. So the Hand of the King, he had that influence on her where she absolutely 
didn't want to listen to what he was saying, but he was right. Everything he said about Renaira was right. Even if there was times where he was doing it to just tweak a little bit more power and gain a little bit more favor for his family. Everything he's ever said about Renaira is right. And this is the point. It comes full closure for Alison and she realizes it. So she tells Christian to stop. He doesn't kill himself. So then we get the impression that in the next episode, potentially there's going to be a bit of a unison. I think Alison's going to strike a deal with Kristen off screen. And in the next episode, just as we we're about to see Renaira get crowned, because I think Viserys is unfortunately dead now. I think he's done. Um, and if he is, I think in the next scene, we will get the coronation just as it's about to happen. I think Alison will put a stop to it. Renaira will get arrested, essentially. And she will make Kristen stand against Renaira and say, one, she slept with him against his will. Well, that's probably what she's going to come out with. She broke her vow as a queen. She's no fit queen anyway because, you know, it's against Targaryen tradition. She's got no claim as it is. Not only that, she's lied to me. I'm the queen. She's countlessly lied to all of you. She sleeps with her uncle even though she didn't. I think all that is going to come out and it's all going to go against her. And then it's going to cause a massive, massive explosion in terms of claims for the throne and things like that. I hope to God Ronira doesn't then go with Daemon. But on that sort of level, but I think they will pair up. I think then they'll join against Alison, potentially the Lannisters, and then the Valerian house will have something to say about it as well because their son's face has just been caved in. There's no marriage proposal now going through. The marriage won't happen. Renai will just turn around and say, fuck you, I've got what I wanted. Um, I did what my dad did, wanted me to do, but my father's now dead, Viserys is gone, so I'm a Targaryen and stamp my foot down because we've seen... Hints of that through this episode and hints of it in prior episodes. So it's, it's absolutely coming. And it ends, unfortunately, after Alicent stopping Kristen from killing himself. It ends with Viserys falling over. He looks like he's absolutely done. He collapses. The camera pans out and we see droplets of blood with rats licking the blood, which is disgusting. And then the episode ends. So for me, guys, this is probably the most dramatic episode so far, I think. It just goes to show we don't need full-on battle scenes all the time. We don't need full-on dragons swooping around and stuff like that. Whilst it's pretty to look at and whilst it's amazing and I'll never get bored of seeing the CGI dragons and I love the battle scenes in this um, and in Game of Thrones, obviously it's known for its battle scenes, but this is just a prime example of when you get the right team together in terms of script writing, actors, story delivery, you get the source guru as well, i.e., George R.R. R. Martin's on this. You get the right director, the right producer, the right sound team. You get the right kit. When it works, it absolutely works. And this episode, for me, is the absolute prime example of that. The one and only thing that could have made it any better is potentially a fight scene, potentially a little battle, but we didn't need it. It was absolutely perfect the way it was. Um, maybe I would have liked to have seen a couple more of the scenes fleshed out because I was really, really hooked on it. But I think they had the sort of balance of giving you enough to want more and not overthrowing it as well. I think it was absolutely perfect. So for me, if I was to give this episode a rating, it's a solid, solid 9 out of 10. One of the best episodes so far, if not the best episode. Absolutely loved it. And it leads into nicely uh, what we're going to see in the upcoming episodes. For me, I think Viserys is dead. We're going to get a sort of let's look at the marriage again in the next episode. But interestingly, I don't know if you guys picked up on this, but in this episode, the maester didn't finish the vows. So when Renaira and Laurel. So for me, what I think is going to happen is we didn't hear Renaira and Laurel finalize their vows. The maester was talking about it. They went back and forth. But I don't know if you guys picked up on it. They didn't end it I don't think I didn't think there was a now you can kiss the bride type of line there was no end and then we, all we get is a scene where Kristen's being stopped that's put a stop to that and Viserys collapses and that puts a stop to the vows being completed as well so what I think is going to happen is Renaira is going to turn around to Laurel and say fuck you my dad's dead the only reason I wanted to do this is because of him he's not here so I don't have to do anything I'm the queen She's going to lay claim to the throne. Valerian, the House Valerian is understandably going to go ballistic because the son's not going to have it because his partner, i.e. 
sexual interest, whatever his lover has just been brutally murdered by her Kingsguard. He knows that she's banging her Kingsguard. That's against morals. Also, she's a woman. She shouldn't be on the throne as it is. So they've already got a substantial case to kick off and, and rebel, basically. Damon's got his own uh, incentives. He's got his own wants and wishes. So that's another thing to watch. The Lannisters are slowly creeping into the picture as well. Plus, you've got the Hand of the King, Otto, and his family, i.e. Alicent's linked into there as well. But he's going to want revenge as well. And I would imagine Alicent's going to say, well, I'm the queen whilst the king's dead. Your claim means nothing. You lied to me. You slept with your uncle. You slept with him, the king's guard. And I think she's going to put Kristen in the picture and get him to stand up against Rhaenyra. I think they're going to have an almighty showdown. And I cannot wait, guys. It's absolutely dangling the carrot for the next episode. It's dangling the carrot for things to come. And this show is absolutely smashing it at the minute. I think it's something that in the prior episodes I loved and there were some that were really good some I wasn't too sure on but I think the more this goes on the more it ties into what we saw in the earlier episodes it's great storytelling cinematography is excellent the characters are amazing they're interesting they're diverse the drama the acting everything about it sort of ties in nicely to the Game of Thrones lore and the universe but also keeps itself original to the core as well and I think it beautifully delivers drama and tension in all the ways that it should. We had Red Wedding sort of reminisces in this one. We've got Damon being Damon. When I was going on a war path in terms of what she wants, she's completely gone down the selfish route now. She's gone fuck you and gone true fire and blood. Viserys is, I think, dead. Christian's, uh, Kristen's been caught out. He's done himself in. But Alison, I think, is going to use him as a pawn. Alicent's fuming, the House Valerian's fuming because, you know, the son's lover has been killed and Rhaenyra, I think, is going to give the V to the the unison of the marriages because I didn't catch the vows. I don't know if you guys did. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but it's, it's mental. It, this is the episode where it's going to tip and I cannot wait to see what happens. But I hope you enjoyed this review, guys. Please do leave a thumbs up if you did and let me know in the comments what you think of it. If you are brand new to the channel as well, please consider subscribing. Hit the bell icon on the channel homepage and you'll be notified next week when episode 6 review goes live. I cannot wait. 9 out of 10 from me. Absolutely loved it. Killing it. I can't say the same for Rings of Power at the minute. I'm hoping that's going to change from next week. But stay tuned for more reviews, guys. Stay tuned for more content. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace.